Milwaukee, Wisconsin is known for a lot of good and a lot of bad. The good being they have incredible sports teams like the Milwaukee Bucks and the Milwaukee Brewers. But they're also known for the bad, which is the notorious cannibalistic serial killer, Jeffrey Dahmer. But what most people do not know is that there has been an unsolved murder for the last few years of up and coming singer, Lala Brown. Before I get any further into this video, I'm Courtney Elise, aka Court Crimes TV, and welcome to my channel. If you happen to enjoy, please like, subscribe, and comment. Let's get into the video. Yolanda Rose Brown was born May 20th, 1986, to parents William and Maria Brown in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. She was the youngest of five children, and though she was the youngest, her parents realized quickly that their daughter had a gift for singing. I'm talking about going up against the bigger girls. Mm -hmm. yeah. She make up her own thing. She yeah. get up there. Anything just like that. Just like that. Writing music just like that. Yeah. Lala knew that at a very young age her voice was unique and she was determined to become a singer. You see at the young age of five Lala was already singing, dancing, and writing her own music. So it honestly came to no one's surprise when she actually really started to pursue her dreams. With her parents support at the age of 11 Lala started to sing professionally. She just had a beautiful voice. and she was also going by the name Premier. Lala would often sing at bars, weddings, and various other events to get her name out there. Y'all, when I say this girl was determined, she was very determined and dedicated into making her dreams, her goal, become a reality. But at the age of 16, she would kind of have to put her dreams on hold because in 2002, she would end up getting pregnant, giving birth to a beautiful baby girl named Amira. Now with the baby girl, raising this baby girl on her own, Lala was more determined than ever to make it. In the fall of 2005, Lala would travel to none other than Black Hollywood itself, Atlanta, Georgia. You know, this was perfect. This was the perfect spot because Atlanta had birthed Plenty of R&B legends like Usher, Escape, Monica, Sierra, and many more. So she was right at home when it came to pursuing a music career in Atlanta. Her big break finally came because she would end up meeting R&B singer slash songwriter Life Jennings. During this time while meeting Life, Life was actually working on his second studio album called The Phoenix and on this album was the track S.E.X. Life would end up asking Lala to be a part of his song S.E.X. and Lala took full advantage of it and she killed her verse in this song. S.E.X. was a cautionary tale to adolescent girls about the dangers of unprotected sex. Now, Life Jennings music always had a very deep meaning like Never Never Land, Must Be Nice, and S.E.X. for example. And this song S.E.X. was every father who had daughters. That was their nightmare because just his storytelling is incredible and this was an awesome song. This song was a huge success. It was a breakout for Lala. This song reached number three on the Billboard Hot R&B slash Hip Hop charts. And it also reached number 37 on Billboard Hot 100. So yeah, Lala was living her dream. Lala was so happy she was living her dream with a hot song and she was also invited to go on tour with Life Jennings. Lala's dream would unfortunately be cut short because following a disagreement Lala would be dismissed from the tour. Now in a recent interview Life was asked about Lala and Life said that Lala pretty much let the fame get to her head. In his words, he recounts a time when he was the headliner of this tour. This was his tour and she was just a guest. And he said that one time he was trying to get into the dressing room, but there was a bodyguard in front of the dressing room. And this bodyguard, you know, opened the door and asked Lala, is it okay for life to come into the dressing room? And this took him back he said because he's like this is my tour why do I need permission to go into the dressing room you know so I'm pretty sure there was more to this disagreement but he wouldn't go any further into detail although she had this major roadblock this did not deter Lala from chasing her dream in June of 2007 Lala would move back to Milwaukee. While home, Lala linked up with one of the best producers from Milwaukee named Jatan 
Kool-Aid Claiborne. Kool-Aid, which was Jatan's nickname, was also a very determined person. He was dead set on making it in the industry as well. Kool-Aid was an incredible artist. He taught himself how to play numerous instruments and he was just self-taught all around. And he she teamed up with the hottest homegrown music producer in the Brew City, Jatan Kool-Aid Claiborne. They called him Kool-Aid because of his big, wide smile. He was across the board talented from anything house, club music, R&B, hip-hop, gospel. Around, and he was incredibly creative, so him linking up with Lala was just destined. At the young age of 22, Kool-Aid would open up his own recording studio called Loud Enough Productions in Milwaukee. He would also end up moving into this studio. That way all of his focus was purely on creating music. So you can say this man literally slept, ate, and breathed music. Now that she was linked up with Kool-Aid, this is when they would both start to work on her debut album. Lala and Kool-Aid were together so much. They were around each other so much day in and day out that their totally platonic friendship would eventually turn into more of a romantic relationship. They would officially be boyfriend and girlfriend. And in my opinion, they were a cute couple. Lala would eventually move into the studio as well. And this is when she would record three songs. I'm feeling it, rescue me, and give them what they want. All of these songs were supposed to be on her up and coming debut album. Lala was grinding day in and day out. She was determined to pursue her goals no matter what roadblocks came in her way and nothing was going to stop her. But unfortunately, with success comes the hate and people started to grow very jealous and envious of Lala and her boyfriend Kool-Aid. Lala and Kool-Aid started to receive numerous threatening phone calls. The phone calls were getting so bad that Lala actually had to go and file for a restraining order. After filing for this restraining order, the studio where Lala and Kool-Aid lived was robbed of his equipment. With the threatening phone calls, the restraining order, and now their house slash recording studio is robbed of everything, this started to really get to Lala. So Lala started to go and search for an apartment in a better area. Um, Kula, he was usually his little upbeat self, but Lala, she was, you could tell something wrong with her. She was like, uh, she was getting like phone calls, threatening phone calls and people hanging up and stuff like that. And that whereas- her life? Threatening her life. But she didn't say who, she didn't say who. Yeah. Or if it was a male or female, she never said. She was actually asking if anybody knew any, you know, apartment listing because she wanted to move from the studio where they were living in. She wanted to move right away because she felt threatened for her life. But she said that three days before she died. On the evening of October 16th of 2007, I guess wanting to get their minds off of just all this negativity going around around them, Lala and Kuli will go and have dinner with Lala's parents. After spending time with her parents, Lala and Kool-Aid were both dropped off back at the studio to go work on more music. But something unusual started to happen. You see, a few days would start to go by and no one has heard from them. Suddenly everything, all communication between Lala and her parents, Kool-Aid and his parents, stopped. Her parents, and I'm 100% sure his parents, tried contacting them, but there was no response. Now, Lala's dad is sure that they're at the studio because like I said, they were always there. They were always making music. He's sure they're there because he's the one that dropped them off at the studio. And it's not like Lala or Kool-Aid to not get back in touch with their families. So something weird is happening. Lala's parents would actually go by the studio and they noticed that the lights were on, but no one was coming to the door when they knocked. I guess they decide to brush it off and they decide to come back the next day and still no one is answering the door but the lights are still on. This is when her dad decides to go to the owner of the building to see if the owner can open the door for them. But unfortunately the owner tells them that he cannot legally open the door for them because they don't have a warrant. So with this information, her parents go down to the police station and file for a missing persons report. After still not hearing from Lala or Kool-Aid, and also the warrant is taking forever to go through. This is when Kool-Aid's brother takes it upon himself to go down to the studio and kick in the door. As soon as Kool-Aid's brother kicks down the door, an extremely foul odor hits him in the face. On October 19th, 
of 2007 in the back room of Kool-Aid Studio were the bodies of Lala and Kool-Aid. They had both been shot multiple times and it's also reported that their bodies were so badly decomposed that they were unrecognizable. Police suspect that the murderer or murderers had to have known Kool-Aid and Lala personally because there was no forced entry and as soon as the murderer came in, Lala and Kool-Aid immediately went back to working on music. Also, they were both shot at close range. Police say that Kool-Aid was shot in the left eye and he was also shot in the hand, I guess trying to defend himself from being shot. They also suspected that Lala tried to run away but was unfortunately blocked by a wall. Now Lala was shot multiple times. She was shot in her back, her neck, her right shoulder, her right forearm, her upper forearm, and a bullet grazed her chest. You know that's sad she was shot that many times. That, that's horrible she was shot period. Also even though there was people in and out of this studio constantly there were no witnesses to the murder. Lala's funeral was held on October 25th of 2007 and she was buried at Graceland Cemetery in Milwaukee. Lala was loved by many. Hundreds of people attended her funeral. Also in attendance was Life Jennings. Life later said in that same interview I mentioned previously, he said that if he knew what was going to happen to Lala, he would have kept her on tour. But it's just sad how things played out. Lala and Kool-Aid's case was featured on America's Most Wanted in 2010 and Celebrity Crime Files on TV One in 2012. But unfortunately, there were no leads until July 12th of 2016. In 2016, police finally had a credible suspect in custody in Arizona on other charges. Milwaukee police say suspect is in custody in another state in connection to the murders of Yolanda Lala Brown and her boyfriend and producer Jay Ton Claiborne. They were shot to death in their Milwaukee recording studio in October of 2007. 21 year old Lala Brown was a rising singing star and had appeared in a video on the BET network. Cash rewards have been offered for information in her killing, but this is the first significant break in the investigation in nearly nine years. Their studio on 55th and Lisbon had been burglarized before the murders. And I spoke with Lala's father tonight and he said he was aware a suspect was in custody. Police say they're awaiting a charging decision from the Milwaukee County District Attorney. And of course, we'll bring you new details as soon as we get them. Live in the newsroom, Terry Sater, WIC. No more information has come out about this person they have in custody. And as of 2023, this case, Lala and Kool-Aid's murder is still unsolved. Now here's my opinion about this case. Whoever murdered Lala and Kool-Aid only did this out of pure jealousy, hatred, and evilness. The murderer saw the potential Lala and Kool-Aid had and this person just cold-bloodedly took two people who were trying to make it out. Two extremely talented people murdered, taken away just like that by somebody they knew. Boosie once said in one of his most popular interviews that rappers, musicians die in in their own city. They get killed in their own city. And the people who murder them are hypnotized with hatred. I mean, you have numerous examples of this. You have FBG Duck, who's from Chicago, was murdered in broad daylight in the wealthiest part of Chicago. You have the real G Money murdered in Baton Rouge. You have Nipsey murdered in Los Angeles in his own neighborhood in Crenshaw. It's sad that people feel the need to murder someone so they don't see them elevate in life. It's sad. You know, Boosie said like the murderer, they get so hypnotized with hatred and they start to see you everywhere. Like they go into the house, their nephew or son doesn't even acknowledge them. They're just listening to, to Boosie. They go outside and their nephew's like, oh, that's a car like Boosie. You know, they go inside and their, their niece is dancing to the song by that artist and they just get so upset that they're like, all I got to do now is just, I'm going to have to kill him. You know, they get so upset that they feel their last resort is to kill this person, which is sad. You know, it's sad that tragedies happen like this, but rest in peace to Lala and Kool-Aid and also rest in peace to Lala's dad because it's unfortunate that he passed away not knowing who killed his daughter. He passed away with that still on his heart. And I hope whoever did this, I hope they're eventually caught. I hope something comes over them and they finally confess, you know. But rest in peace to Lala Kool-Aid and also Lala's father, William.